Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. We talk about Blu-rays here, and today I am going to talk about some more cartoons and some other goofy stuff. Some burger-related goofy stuff. Uh, but let's start with cartoons. So, Warner Brothers, Warner Archive has put out these wonderful Looney Tunes collections. I've talked about them here before, these Collector's Choice uh, Blu-rays, and you have Volume 1, Volume 2, and each one of these has about 25 um, cartoons, which, you know, are said to be from deep inside the Warner Brothers vault, and supposedly not released as part of any other um, Blu-ray collections. So, had these two sets, I guess they were doing well, because now we have Volume 3, Collector's Choice, Volume 3, Looney Tunes, and... All your favorite Looney Tunes are here, as you can see. Bugs Bunny, Foghorn, Leghorn, Elmer Fudd, The Roadrunner, Daffy Duck. I love them all. I'm a huge cartoon person, as I have expressed. Um, but so this, uh, they say the third time's the charm, uh, to which we'll add three times the fun and 300 times the laughs. Looney Tunes Collector's Choice Volume 3 provides 25 classics, uh, Warner Brothers cartoons uh, for the first time on Blu-ray and spanning 30 years, 1934 to 1964, the golden age of uh, animation and with rarities featuring Daffy Duck, Foghorn Leghorn, and Tweety and Sylvester, directed by uh, Warner Brothers cartoon geniuses Chuck Jones, Frizz Freeling, Tex Avery, and Robert McKimson. This collection is one for the ages. Highlights include some of the first and last original Bugs Bunny shorts, landmark early appearances by Egghead and Elmer, uh, hilarious uh, gems with Bobo the Elephant and Quentin Quayle, and the first color uh, Merry Melody short, Honeymoon Hotel. So uh, what are you waiting for? Um, so, okay, so this one, does this have any features? I forget. Um no, it does have this warning, which is on the all, all of them, which I find intriguing, is intended for the adult collector and may not be suitable for children. So keep that in mind, folks. Some of these cartoons are a little edgy. Um, but okay, let's go through all the cartoons that are in this set. All right, we'll start at the top. Um, let me make sure I'm lining this up right. Yes. Okay, so... In the order that's on the back, basically, we have one called A Feud There Was from 1938. This is directed by the great Tex Avery. And it's the McCoys and the Weavers are two fe fe ugh, feuding hillbilly clans. Elmer Fudd, Peacemaker, attempts to end the fighting, but violence and zaniness win out. So that is from 1934, 38, excuse me. Then we have China Jones from 1959. This is directed by Robert Bobby McKimson. Uh... Daffy Duck is China Jones, a fortune-seeking Irish private eye working in the Far East. He finds a call for help in a Chinese fortune cookie and decides to investigate, acting on a tip displayed on a solo musician's drum. Daffy uh, slash Jones uh, goes to a pub owned by Limey Louie to look for clues. Louie is, in fact, an ex-convict who blames Jones for sending him to jail. And then it kind of goes into, like, the whole plot. But uh, Porky Pig also appears in this cartoon as Charlie Chung, the Plain Coast Chinese... Uh, Chinese detective uh, very interesting yes uh, okay so um, Cinderella meets Fella this is from 1938 also Tex Avery and it's Cinderella goes to the ball where she meets Prince Charming Egghead and Egghead is a character he looks a little bit like Wimpy uh, from the Popeye cartoons if you remember him anyway that is Cinderella meets Fella uh, Dumb Patrol from 1964, directed by Jerry Chin Um Biplane battles over France in World War I between Bugs and Baron Yosemite Sam, Von Sh Sham. Uh, I do remember this one. I, I love this sort of World War II. You know, it's very much like the, the Roadrunner Coyote, you know, in a way, because Sam always ends up getting the crap beat out of him in one way or another. Um, okay, so Egghead Rides Again from 1937, also Tex Avery, city dweller Egghead dreams of being a cowboy, but his bouncing around gets him kicked out of his boarding house. He sees an ad for a ranch looking for a cowboy uh, and applies. 
His tryout included tests of mark- marksmanship and use of a branding iron, but most of it consists of chasing down and roping a troublesome little calf. Um, <clears throat> he passes the test, but the job is not what he dreamed of. Okay, so then next we have Elmer's Pet Rabbit, 1941, directed by the great Chuck Jones. Uh, Elmer Fudd gets more than he bargained for from his new pet rabbit. Of course, that's got to be Bugs <clears throat> in a box. Okay, next up, Hobo Bobo, 1947, Robert McKimson directs. Little Bubba the Elephant decides to leave a jungle where he is assigned to the thankless task of moving logs with his trunk for a glamorous life in a circus in America. On the advice of a minor bird, Bobo paints himself pink to gain access to a shipbound for the U.S. because nobody on the ship will admit to seeing pink elephants, much less act to remove uh, the presumed hallucination. And then, again, Bobo arrives in America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> but I do like the idea that around this time, you know, pink elephants was something you would see if you drank too much or something. You had, like... Uh, you know, Dumbo is a big example of that. Okay, Honeymoon Hotel. So I guess this is the earliest color Merry Melodies, I think they said on the back. I may be misquoting. Honeymoon Hotel from 1934, directed by Earl Duvall. <clears throat> After introducing the small small town bug town inhabited by bugs, this short shows what happens to two honeymooning love bugs at the Honeymoon Hotel due to, in fact, that their love is a little bit odd. Uh, then we have Hot Hop, Skip, and a Chump, 1942, Frizz Freeling, a grasshopper toys with crows trying to catch him. Um, then we, I mean, there's a lot of these folks, so let's keep going. I Only Have Eyes for You, 1937, Tex Avery, the Iceman is in love with a pretty girl and old spinster is pining and cooking for him. But his dream girl prefers crooners like Bing Crosby, Rudy Valley, and Eddie Cantor. After leaving her, he spots the sign of an imitator and thinks he could ask him to do the crooning for him while he's trying to date his girl. Imitator accepts, and the first trick is working until the imitator gets too cold, etc., etc. So you have sort of a Cyrano kind of thing happening there. Um, all right, next up we have Mexican Joyride from 1947, directed by Arthur Davis, Daffy Duck drives to Mexico for a vacation after a harrowing experience with the local cuisine that literally sets his mouth on a fire. Daffy goes to a bullfight ring to observe the spectacle. When Daffy jeers at the bull, the horned beast removes clothes from the human matador and puts them on Daffy as a challenge to the duck, etc. Becomes a bullfighting thing. The Mouse on 57th Street, 1961, directed by Chuck Jones. An inebriated mouse with a throbbing headache takes a priceless diamond, thinking it's a soothing piece of ice. Two policemen, one of them a lunkhead, are assigned to recover the missing jewel. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. is the name, 1935, Frizz Freeling. A merman and mermaid girl play, explore a sunken ship, and deal with a giant octopus. Uh, Of Rice and Men, I believe... Of Rice and Hen, excuse me, 1953, Robert McKimson. Um, Miss Prissy, the slow-witted hen, sets out to land a husband, Foghorn Leghorn, and Barnyard Dog is willing to help her by dressing as a rooster to rival Foghorn Leghorn's non-existent affections and make him jealous so that he'll marry Prissy without thinking. Foghorn Leghorn falls for the scheme, hook, line, and sinker. I remember this one. I remember the dog dressing up as Foghorn. Uh, Pre-Hysterical Hair, 1958, Robert McKimson. Bugs discovers a Micronesian film documentary in Cro-Magnon scope showing Elmer Fudstone and Sabretooth Bunny in 10,000 BC. This is cool. I, I don't know if I've seen this one. Um, but, but Bugs has got like giant Sabretooth front teeth. Uh, Punch Trunk, 1953, Chuck Jones. A tiny elephant emerges from a banana boat and wanders about town, causing an uproar among the populace. Settings are attributed to uh, variously to mass hysteria, insanity, and dipsomania. Quentin Quayle, uh, 1946, Chuck Jones. Take off on Fanny Bryce's Baby Snooks radio program. I love these old, out-of-date pop culture references that you know I'm sure a lot of us miss now uh you watching an old looney tunes cartoon that stuff just goes right over your head um an exasperated mr quail tries to catch a worm for his whining daughter baby toots and gets the worst from a tough crow 
as uh, who has designs on the worm himself. And then our last group here, we have Riffy Raffy Daffy, 1948, Arthur Davis. No matter where Vagabond Daffy Duck goes to sleep, policeman Porky Pig is there to toss him out. Finally, Porky kicks him out, uh, out of the city park entirely, and it starts snowing. Daffy decides to take shelter at the closed Macy's department store when Porky catches him. Porky's the security guard. Uh, he's determined to get rid of Daffy once and for all. Um, Saddle Silly, 1941, Chuck Jones, a pony express rider's adventures in getting the mail through, uh, Indian country. Sheep Ahoy, 1954, Chuck Jones, this is a, uh, coyote and sheepdog. Uh, after punching in for work, Sam Sheepdog deals with Ralph Wolf's attempt, attempts to steal the flock, which this time, uh, make use of a giant red balloon a fake Acme brand rock, and a bicycle-propelled submarine. These are fun, a fun alternative to the Roadrunner Coyote cartoons. The Sheepish, a Sheepish Wolf from 1942 for his freeling. Sam Sheepdog and Ralph Wolf are both just trying to do what they have to do. This is much earlier cartoon designs of these characters. They look much different than the ones I always remember. Uh, there ought to be a law. 1953, Robert McKimson. This documentary-style cartoon tells of the development of the automobile in America and the comical effects of cars, traffic, and road design on various kinds of people. I enjoy these documentary ones, especially if it's, you know, from 1953, so it's the 1953 take on cars and traffic and such. I'm sure some hasn't changed, but... Uh, tugboat Granny, 1956, Frizz Freeling, Tweety Bird, and Granny are at the controls of a tugboat that Sylvester tries to unsuccessfully board. Uh, War and Pieces, I believe this is the 1964 Chuck Jones, um, and it is Roadrunner uh, and Wiley Coyote. After a failed series of attempts to catch the ever-elusive Roadrunner with a grenade, a bow, a rope, invisible paint, I'm not going to spoil all this stuff here, um, Wiley Coyote uses a rocket to chase after the bird. Um, I mean, we've seen this, I, this is, I've seen that scenario a few times, so I don't know if I've seen this one or not, but it sounds familiar. Uh, and last, Wet Hair, 1962, Robert McKimson, uh, Block Jacques Chalac, I definitely remember that name, dams the river and plans to charge everyone a fortune for water, but not if Bugs Bunny has anything to say about it. I do remember enjoying this one and that name, Block Jacques Chalac. Um, okay, so that is what is included in the Looney Tunes uh, Collector's Choice Volume 3. So as I said, I have some other things here. I have some silliness and burger-related silliness, and that is Good Burger 2 on Blu-ray. And I know this is like kind of a joke for some, but um, and it was for me, I'll be honest. When I first saw Good Burger, when it came out in 97, I think, uh, I was... I, I, I thought there's no way this is something I'm going to enjoy, right? You know, it's, it's just can't, it can't be. Um, and I didn't realize the roots of the show, which I'll get into the roots of the characters anyway, because you have, uh, Kel Mitchell playing Ed and Keenan Thompson playing Dexter Reed. Uh, in the first film, uh, <laughs> Dexter, he gets a new car or he borrows a car and he ends up hitting Sinbad, his teacher's car, and then he's got to pay the bill for the repairs. So he has to go to work at Good Burger, and he meets Ed, and Ed is just ridiculous. Ed is Ed is very difficult to describe, and why he's funny, if I tried to tell you, you maybe wouldn't think it was funny, and you might see it and still not think it's funny. Um, but there's something really funny about his taking everything literally. He's almost like a cartoon character, brought to life really beautifully by Cal Mitchell. And he's just so ridiculous in that first movie. Uh, first movie has lots of great cameos from like Shaquille O'Neal, George Clinton, Robert Wool. Uh, Abe Vigoda has a actually pretty big part. And there's a bunch more folks in it that I recognized. It has a crazy dance scene. I'm still talking about Good Burger 1 here. Uh, at a mental institution that is very much felt like it was taking off on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And they sort of echo something like that in the second movie, uh, which, okay, so Good Burger 2 is a, what I think was originally conceived as a straight to Paramount Plus movie, although it could have maybe had some aspirations for theatrical release, but 
I saw it on Paramount Plus, and I have to say, so the basic idea is that Dexter Reed is down on his luck after another of his inventions fails. He's always sort of scheming. That's the Keenan Thompson character. And so he has to go back to Good Burger. Ed welcomes Dex back with open arms, gives him his old job back. But now Ed has a family uh, and a new crew. But Ed's got his son who's exactly like him and doing all the goofy stuff. And it's got a, an interesting subplot with Lil Rel Howery as like a corporate dude who's trying to get Good Burger um, made into a franchise that so that Ed can make a bunch of money, basically. But it ends up backfiring and they end up sort of selling it to an evil uh, corporate conglomerate. Um, and it, uh, and they want to make robot ads and it's, it's bizarre. But what I will say about it is it amazingly captures the goofiness and the surreal nature of the comedy that the first film, you know, had. And we're talking like 24 years ago or 23 years. What is it? Three. Yeah. More than 25 years ago. Right. Uh, when the first movie comes out. So the idea that you could, and a lot of that has to do with the Kel Mitchell performance. Like he just is Ed, like he just nails that character and is so ridiculous with all his line deliveries and all the silly things that he takes. Literally. I adore him. I think he's fantastic. And the way that he and Keenan Thompson play off each other is priceless. So anyway, they have to save good burger yet again, basically. But like I said, bringing in the kids, uh, for Ed and all this other stuff, you're like, oh, is this going to be able to tonally, you know, line up with the first movie? And I really do think it does. I think you can watch them back to back and they feel of a piece in this way that I just think is kind of amazing. Um, you know, if you have nostalgia for this stuff, if you're a kid who grew up with Nickelodeon watching, you know, Keenan and Kel there, uh, then this is definitely something that uh, I think you'll enjoy, right? Um you know, I, I, I didn't know that the show, uh, the 1994 Nickelodeon show, All That, uh, with Keenan and Cal was where the Ed character was born, and I'll get into that a little more in a second here, but uh, I wanted to get this on Blu-ray, I wanted to have a physical copy, because um, it is available digitally, you know, outside of Paramount+, Plus, so it's not like one of those Apple movies where it's locked into Apple and you cannot get it anywhere else, even if you wanted to pay them money, Uh I get it. I get it. You want to have content to draw people in, but I still would love a physical copy of some of those movies. Um, so anyway, it's nice to have a nice physical Blu-ray of Good Burger 2. It comes with uh, some features here that I will go through. Um, it has a uh, home of the good bloopers, extended version, eight minutes and 15 seconds of bloopers. And it is I'm kind of a sucker for bloopers, you know, just watching people crack up during a take when they know, you know, they're supposed to be being straight faced is kind of always something that will make me laugh. But seeing Keenan and Cal crack each other up and especially uh, Cal just keeps losing it during certain takes. And I got to give him credit because playing this character is as ridiculous as he is as and as straight faced and dumb as he is has got to be difficult without laughing sometimes. So it's super fun to watch this blooper reel. I really enjoyed it. And it is sort of recycled throughout some of the rest of these features. There's something called the Comfort Food Classic, and it's four and a half minutes long, and that's interviews with Keenan Thompson and Kel Mitchell talking about why Good Burger is comfort food, why it's good. Uh, again, harking back to the Ed character created in 1994 on All That and showing clips from All That as well as sh- clips from the um, original movie, but to see them so young is just adorable. Watching them work together and crack each other up on all that with the Ed character is pretty great because um, I didn't know that. and I, So for me, Ed just was a fully formed weird character in the Good Burger movie, and I had no idea. Uh, okay, so behind the scenes with Keenan and Cal is another feature out here. It's 8 minutes and 16 seconds, and it's them talking about why Keenan and Cal talking about why they're excited that they're back about all the great things in the movie, the jokes, the cameos, um, and, you know, showing some of the bloopers and things like that, just having fun on set. Then we have meet the new employees. 
or meet the employees, M-E-A-T, very clever, two and a half minutes, interviews with the new cast, all the young new cast members and some of the older new cast members that are now part of the crew at, at Good Burger. Uh, there's some twins and there's uh, a bunch of younger folks and an older lady that get interviewed about getting cast and their excitement meeting Keenan and Kel. And then there's another Q&A with the new crew that's six and a half minutes and it's, again, those same new cast members now talking about their characters, what it's like working with Keenan and Kel. Each one does their own Ed impression. They talk about stunts maybe they did, their best day on set, uh, some other sort of fluffy questions, but it's cute stuff. Um, then you have the employee training video, which is almost three minutes. A very goofy video with Ed being Ed and uh, quote-unquote training with different lessons like, you know, burgers, taking orders, Ed sauce, hygiene, do's and don'ts and delivery. And typically Ed will, you know, do the wrong thing, you know, in the, in the, uh, sort of training s- section. But again, cute, funny, obviously made for promotional materials, but still enjoyable. And lastly, there's a good burger one movie recap. That's about five minutes long. And it is exactly what it sounds like it is. It goes back through the entire first movie in case you don't want to watch that, which you should watch because it's super fun and goofy. And if you like, if you end up liking good burger two, you will have liked good burger one. Like I said, they are of a piece and they are a lot of fun to watch. And I, I never would have thought that actually, I remember back in the video store days, my friend and I were just thought it was kind of a joke. And then he, he started watching it and doing imitations of Ed. And I was like, what is this? And I finally watched it. I'm like, Oh my God, this is ridiculous. This is funny. I, I can't explain why it's so funny to me, but it works. So I was very excited when good burger two was announced and very excited now to have this Blu-ray. Anyway, thank you so much for listening and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.